The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We'll explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is the Honorable C. Virginia Fields, the President and CEO of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, and my good friend. Hi, Virginia. Hi, Roscoe. How are you? We've been working on this for a long time. <laughs> we were just chatting. We go back to 1987, and the Black Leadership Commission on AIDS has been the pivotal organization to bring the awareness and the services to AIDS in the black community. So tell us about where we are now. And first of all, again, let me thank you because you were one of the pioneers in uh, making, bringing this uh, organization into existence that uh, 25 years ago. And uh, in November, uh, in Black, uh, as it is uh, referred to, will be 25 years old, and thus we are the oldest and largest organization of its kind in the nation where we work to bring together not only leading clergy in communities, but the business community, the health community, persons living with AIDS, service providers, and other community stakeholders to make sure that the resources and the policies that are, uh, are in place as it impacts HIV AIDS. So after 25 years, while there have been many struggles, many challenges, and many hurdles to overcome, and we still face many of those, we are alive, we are well. And I would say, uh, Roscoe, that um, the voice and the work of this organization is more needed now than ever. Because here we are 31 years now since the Center for Disease Control uh, made known what this disease is. We still have today over 50,000 of new HIV infections in these United States. And many of them are predominantly minority. Over 50% are blacks. Uh, with respect to black women, 66% of all of the new cases are new HIV infection or black women. And over 50% or more are black gay men and black men who have sex with men. So blacks uh, are disproportionately uh, reflected or represented in this new in this disease in terms of the new cases and when you put that with the Hispanic community you're looking at over 80 percent the question that anybody would ask is why is it so predominant in our community and not in the larger white community you know that question is often asked and I'm not sure that I have the answer mm -hmm. but I think that we can look at several things one we're not being tested so we don't know our status. And when one is not tested and not knowing their status, they can unwittingly transmit that disease to others with whom they have sex or share needles. And so in the black community, because of stigma, discrimination, other fears, blacks are not being tested to the number that obviously we should be given the, the number of uh, new infections among black communities. We also have to look at areas, and it's certainly not to, to, to pinpoint or identify any one specific population, but we have a sizable number of African Americans who are in prisons. And we have seen an increase among the number of infections within the prison system. And there is important legislation that has been introduced year after year by Congresswoman Maxine Waters to have inmates tested going in and coming out. Right. And if they're coming out positive, even though they didn't go in positive, they became positive while in the system, to make sure that they are also linked to care as they leave that institution. We aren't doing that, and we know that there are a sizable number of um, people in our community who are in prison coming back into the community. So we have to look at all of these factors, and we have to look at personal behavior. Mm -hmm. We, Despite the information that we have just on the data and what I just mentioned to you, we still have far too many of our people who are having unprotected sex, sex rather, who are engaged in sexual activity with multiple partners. 
because when it comes to women, the data shows that women are becoming infected through uh, heterosexual uh, sexual contact, not intravenous drug use by and large. So we have to be concerned too about who are our partners, how many partners do we have, what do we know about each other, and all of that, I think, all of those are important factors to be considered in response to your question. Well, you've actually talked about why black are so important, education, advocacy, awareness, because going back when we first started, uh -huh. there was some homophobia in the black community, there were some people who said it was a wrath of God, we had to get the faith-based community, and black has done an outstanding job of getting the faith-based community where we started to now where they understand. What's happening with our faith-based initiative today? I don't think that the faith-based community gets enough credit mm -hmm. for the role that they are playing, and you're absolutely right. We started out very slow in mm -hmm. response to this, and unfortunately, we still have a great deal of homophobia, discrimination, and stigma, mm -hmm. even among some of our faith leaders, so it remains work to be done. But through the work of In Blacka, we have affiliates now in 11 cities across the country, Tampa, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Detroit, New York City, Albany, Rochester, Syracuse, and Buffalo, and Long Island. And each one of those affiliates are uh, led by a, a leading clergy member in that community. And through their work in outreach in their cities and on a national level, we are seeing black clergy step up where one, they are talking about HIV AIDS much more, either through their sermons, through their prayers at the church, as well as through literature and information in the bulletin. That's very important with respect to education getting done. We are seeing them uh, provide or lead on community forums mm -hmm. and speaking out more boldly from the pulpit about HIV and creating awareness. So we are seeing a turnaround there, but we need to do more. Here in New York City, through some special funding, which we are most appreciative, coming from the New York City Council. It allows our organization to work with over 60 houses of worship and 28 or more community-based organizations. And working in that way, we're able to expand the uh, education component, the training component, the awareness, and testing. We do a lot to do testing and linking people to care. And that's important, too, because the voices of clergy are leading on that. Well, what has happened over the years is that the care and the treatment has been so successful that people can continue to live productive lives with the uh, disease. So the question that would be asked is, how do you translate your education into awareness, into care? And as a professor, you know, education is something that is ongoing. You have to repeat the same thing over and over and over. And you're doing a good job. You know, <laughs> sometimes you think you've turned the corner and you see it. Oh, no, I've got to say it again. So it is important, and this takes me to an area that I think uh, we, we, we've been stressing and we need to do more. We're doing okay right now in New York City, and that is comprehensive sex education in the schools. We need to make sure that in all of our school systems across this country, that we have comprehensive sex education that deals with human sexuality in general and also focus on HIV, AIDS, transmission of the disease, hepatitis C, B. which is another uh, big problem among blacks, <clears throat> and other sexually transmitted infections. But we're seeing a tremendous pushback in many of our cities where we have affiliates, where parents and others don't believe that there should be a focus on this, yet we're seeing increases in the number of sexually transmitted infection among students, and it's not happening by osmosis. Mm -hmm. We're seeing pregnancies, teenagers, mm -hmm. not just immaculate, mm -hmm. you know, the way our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born. Mm -hmm. Not that, that's not the case, right? So what is happening with all of this, and parents are saying, no, they don't want it in the school. So we need to do much more in pushing, which is one of the key 
policy issues within our organization to get companies sex education in all of the schools. As I said, we're doing okay here in New York City because I think it was last year that Mayor Bloomberg mandated mm -hmm. that there be a focus on HIV AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. So we need to do more in that area. We have to continue to carry the message as we move across the country, speaking to groups, especially our non-traditional organizations, our sororities, our fraternities, our coalitions, 100 black men, 100 black women, and engaging them in the fight so that as they work with their membership, they too will be able to carry the message. So this is ongoing, uh, and we do that on a very regular basis. As you were speaking, I was just wondering, uh, what is the basis of parents' denial of sex education for their kids? Or what do they think they're accomplishing by that? What I've heard from those who've chosen to talk about it they often speak about this being a, 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 a way to encourage yeah. sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and my counter to that is that hopefully is a way for them to make better choices, whether it's abstinence or if they are going to engage, not because we're talking about it, at least they know how to protect themselves and they know some of the uh, pitfalls and dangers of having sex, unprotected sex. It could lead to pregnancy, but it could also lead to HIV, which still today is not, not curable. Mm -hmm. It can be treated and we are seeing people live longer yeah. who have the disease, but <coughs> there is no cure as of today for HIV. Well, one of the things that comes up when you begin to deal with this is how do you get the political will to move these programs into the schools, into the community? Again, that too is ongoing. It, it requires a great deal of uh, work with our elected leaders, mm -hmm. educating them and their staff. Uh, just this year, for example, we were able to have a congressional briefing in Washington, D.C. that focused on the impact <coughs> of HIV AIDS among women. Mm -hmm. uh, the room that they assigned us to was not as large as it could have been or should have been, and there was an overflow crowd, especially staff of various congressional members, and it was such a learning experience for that staff, they had no idea about the impact of HIV AIDS <coughs> among black women. They had no idea about the gaps in services, say, uh, what it takes to address HIV AIDS among women. For example, when a woman goes to a center for um, reproductive uh, sexual uh, treatment, of, of s treatment for repro of reproductive services is what I was trying to say, that there should be inclusion there around HIV testing, mm -hmm. information about HIV in a place where she is more willing to receive mm -hmm. good information, but that is still separated. So we, through that briefing, we were able to teach congressional staff members. And from that point, Hopefully they go back and work with their members, but we also do a number of visits on Capitol Hill working to educate uh, the congressional members themselves. Now toward that end, as you uh, will remember, because I think you also participated in a meeting about two or three years ago mm -hmm. that in Blacka convened with over 150 mm -hmm. clergy, business leaders, mm -hmm. elected leaders, advocates, persons living with AIDS and others. And out of that, Congressman Rangel introduced two years ago a major piece of legislation, the National Black Clergy uh, Elimination Act. And that now has been reintroduced this year by Congressman Rangel and by Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. So having that legislation introduced in Congress, still getting other congressional members to sign on to it, it's important. If we will ever be able to pass it, you know how Congress is, who knows? Yeah. But the efforts must continue and keep it in the forefront. So we're constantly having to meet with, educate not only the staff but the congressional members themselves and to the extent that we do that with other others across the country our message gets through and it's a continuing effort 
And now your predecessor, Deborah Frazier Howes, is working with a company now on uh, at-home testing for AIDS. Could you tell us a little about the progress on that and what that is going to do? Yes, as a matter of fact, earlier this summer, and uh, Dr. Butts, who serves as the chair of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS Board of Directors, uh, he and I spoke before the FDA Food Drug Administration subcommittee that was looking at uh, this particular uh, kit or this system called over-the-counter HIV testing. And in fact, the FDA approved it. So now they are about to launch this sometime in October. And what it is, is a kit whereby now a person who might think or, or would like to know and maybe even afraid to go to the doctor but might be able to deal with it on a, you know, themselves can within their own home or within the privacy of their space test themselves by a swab of the gum and you put it in a solution and it will give a reading that uh, would say, you know, maybe positive or negative. If it turns out that the reading is positive, you still have to have a blood confirmatory test. That alone <coughs> is not sufficient. So that now has passed and I think it will be going on the market sometime, certainly within the next couple of months. Now. You can well imagine the concerns that some people had that, you know, will somebody jump out the window or be so afraid? But they did a lot of focus groups. They met with a lot of people around the country. And I think that they have built in some very valuable and necessary systems, a hotline that if a person might have any questions mm -hmm. about taking the test or the results of the test, you can call this hotline. That is up running and it is in many different languages. Uh, they have been very responsive in terms of the instructions, and we believe that this is another important tool. It's not the only one, but as we look at vaccines still to come on the market, as we look at other forms of treatment, increased or enhanced testing, over-the-counter in-home testing now is just one more tool in the arsenal kit. Now, of course, AIDS is an international, a global phenomenon. Unfortunately, in many places in Africa, for example, it's wiped out a tremendous amount of the population. What is Black doing with AIDS programs internationally? Currently, we're not uh, doing so much internationally. We still focus on the domestic front, and partly because... we got plenty to do. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. Partly because of that, and there's such a sense of complacency on the domestic front that HIV is no longer a problem. And among our younger generation who did not see the number of people who were dying and struggling with the disease in the 70s and the 80s, they simply believe that if they become infected, all they've got to do is pop a pill. Many images, and I will say, like say maybe they look at Magic Johnson, well, he's positive. But Magic Johnson probably has the best of health care that many others cannot afford. And he probably has the discipline to make sure that he takes his medication. Mm -hmm. But I've heard far too many young people say, well, you know, if I get it, all I got to do is pop a pill. That requires, again, much more education. So because of the complacency, we have to keep out there doing what it is that uh, we must do on the domestic front. Mm -hmm. Now we do work with some of the <coughs> groups internationally by way of sharing uh, information and materials. Uh, two years ago, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Butts and I participated in a forum in the Netherlands where he was invited as one of the clergy to be a part of a, of a, of a forum, a conference on HIV AIDS on the global front. And out of that, we have now been working with clergy uh, to, to uh, be more responsive on the global front. But we do not have programs uh, globally. We're still focused here domestically. Of course, you made a very good point. The complacency that many people in the larger community have about HIV AIDS is really destructive because it gives a false impression that everything is okay and everything is getting better, but it's definitely far from okay. It is so far from okay when you look at over 50,000 
new infections annually and half of those being in the black mm -hmm. community. So I would say that our work is, uh, you know, still very much needed. And, and, and one of the concerns I have with this is when we look at the funding streams now, uh, whether it's from the Center for Disease Control or other federal <coughs> agencies that fund uh, this work in HIV, most of it is going to the treatment and care side. And we argue that prevention must not be left behind because, yes, we must take care of those who are already positive by way of treatment and care. But we need to look at how do we address prevention, helping people who are negative stay negative. You're going to do that through education, awareness, getting people tested, and getting people focused on behavior. That's prevention. But those are the areas that are really struggling now with respect to funding in the private sector, the philanthropic sector, foundations, as well as government. And it's uh, really a very, very difficult task right now, raising money to continue to do training, education, policy, advocacy work. But I contend that unless we continue to do that, we're going to be treating people because more people are going to become negative and it's going to be about treatment and care. And, uh, you know, we fight this battle all the time. Now, if anyone who's watching the show wants to make a contribution to the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, how do they do it? Well, they can certainly go on our website, www.nblca.org, or they can call our office, 212-614-0023, or send the check <laughs> to 120 Wall Street, New York, New York, 1005. But they can certainly go on our website, www.nblc.org, and there's a way to contribute. And we encourage uh, all, and contributions are welcome. And also, if they have uh, an organization in their community or in their church, they can invite uh, speakers to come and talk about HIV AIDS. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, staff, as well as myself and board members, we are available to uh, work and go out and speak. Uh, we have affiliates, as I said, in the various cities and here in New York. Our affiliate chair, newly appointed, is the Reverend Carl Washington mm -hmm. from the New Mount Zion Church there on 140th Street. And um, available to go out and speak. We love speaking about this, especially among those non-traditional organizations because they feel they are not affected. And I, I, I can't tell you how much time is spent sometime just talking about this and, and, and to see the response. I didn't know. I never knew. Mm -hmm. And I use myself as an example. Before I started working in this field, coming out of elected office, I had no idea mm -hmm. how bad HIV AIDS is in the black community. And that's part of what led me to make the commitment to do this work now because I've always been interested and engaged in health issues and health disparities. And when Deborah Frazier Health made it known to me, I said, what? What are we doing? So that's part of what got me in it. And I use that same approach to bring others in to help. Well, the passion that you show in just talking about it uh, is indicative of the importance of it. As an elected official, you were always helping out, speaking, and so on. But now you have this passion, this is zero, pa zero in passion on making the black community aware of AIDS and doing the things we need to do to uh, deal with it. What about your materials? What kind of materials do you have? We have uh, brochures. We have what we call pamphlets that we distribute mm -hmm. as we move around. And we do a lot of speaking, like at conferences. For example, back in July of this year, the International AIDS Conference, which occurs every two years, was here in these United States, in Washington, D.C., for the first time in over 20 years. And it couldn't come here until now because there was a ban on anyone coming into the United States mm -hmm. who was positive. <coughs> and to our credit of our president, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, uh, he lifted the ban and so people could come and therefore the conference can co could come here. And we were very pleased to present uh, the work that we do 
at the International AIDS Conference um, by mobilizing and empowering people at the community level, showing how important it mm -hmm. is to strengthen that uh, support locally and get people to buy into what it is that you're doing because we can't be everywhere, so then you have foot soldiers out there doing that. We were able to do that through workshops, through poster presentations. We will be going to the United States Conference on AIDS in the next couple of weeks and doing similar kind of work. And we also do webinars this past week, uh, working with Dr. Monica Sweeney, who's an assistant commissioner at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We were able to uh, present a webinar on hepatitis C, which is also very, very much a problem in the black community. Uh, and we're just starting in terms of education around that. So through pamphlets, through conferences, speaking engagements, and um, various matters like that, uh, activities like that, it, we get the message out. It certainly has been a pleasure talking with C. Virginia Fields, the president and CEO of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, and the telephone number and the website are all there for us to respond. Thanks for being with us today, Virginia. Thank you.